Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, presentation for uh, series number five, uh, May 4th, 2024, entitled Faith Against All Odds. And so, uh, to begin with, uh, you know, if you'd like, uh, you can share this posting in YouTube with your friends. And, uh, you know, so that uh, at least uh, they would know that there is still this uh, uh, series that is going on uh, every quarter. So, uh, I'd like to uh, again invite you, if you're around here in uh, Redondo Beach area, uh, South Bay, uh, Southern California, and if you happen to come around, you are invited to attend our Sabbath school and, of course, the church, uh, the Sabbath morning. And so, uh, before we begin with our presentation, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, this morning, we thank you again for uh, the opportunity, the, the lessons that we are going to present here in space. May it be that... Uh, as we discuss and talk about details that uh, you guide us, that we may be enlightened, uh, the history of your church uh, during the early days of Christians, uh, early centuries, and towards, uh, you know, uh, the end. And may it be that uh, uh, as we go through the, reading the Bibles, that uh, tidbits of it, that, that we may be able to learn more about uh, your care for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, faith, against all, all, faith against all odds. And here is our key text this morning. Uh, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119 verse 11. So the Protestant reformers had something 21st century people desperately need a purpose for their lives. So in this book, uh, The Empty Self, renowned American psychologist Philip Cushman discusses people who live purposeless lives. Their beliefs are shallow, little of real significance matters to them, and they have nothing worth dying for, so they have little worth living for. So... Uh, uh, but the men and women and children of the Protestant Reformation were dramatically different. They had an abiding purpose worth living for. And what they believed mattered, and they were not willing to compromise their integrity. The core beliefs were an inseparable part of them. To deny this belief was to deny their very identity. And in the face of death itself, they had an inner peace. So this morning, this is our the discussion here, an overview. In the 16th century, the work began 200 years earlier by Wycliffe. And the star of the Reformation began to shine brightly. The splendor of the Reform had arrived. And the Reform was based on five fundamental points. And... Uh, Sola Scriptura, Scriptures only. And Sola Gracia, only grace. Sola Fede, faith alone. And Solus Christus, Christ alone. And Sole Deo Gloria, to God alone the glory. So uh, those are the five fundamental points that the, the Reformers uh, based on their understanding of what the Bible says about. So the foundation of faith. Sole Scriptura, Sole Deo Gloria, the Bible available to everyone, the Bible interpreter. And then, the foundation of salvation, Sola Gracia, Sola Fide, Solus Christus, uh, only grace, only by faith alone, and uh, by Christ alone, grow in grace here. So, that is our overview of our discussion this morning. So, uh, in, the, in the historical focus of this lesson is on the great reformers Luther and Swingley up to the famous protests of the princes 
in AD 1517 to 1530. This is within uh, about 13 years, the Great Controversy, chapters 7 to 11. And the lessons notes that since the Reformers had message they felt was worth dying for, it would also be a message worth living for. So the lesson explores biblical passages related to scriptures where, which were at the heart of the developments described in these chapters of great controversy. And so uh, uh, in this week's study, uh, with examples from reformations, we will explore how the life-changing teaching of scriptures provide the basis for genuine purpose and true meaning in life. Understanding this eternal truth will prepare us for the final crisis in the great controversy between good and evil. The battle the reformers fought is not yet over, and we have been called to pick up where they left off. We too can discover a God big enough for every challenge we face, a God who gives our lives meaning and purpose as nothing worldly ever could. And so, we are going to deal with the foundation of faith. He, the foundation of faith. What does God's word alone? On our Sunday section, God's word alone. So, read, we are going to read Psalms 119, 103, 104, to 104, and then 147 and 162. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, chapter 119 is the longest chapter in the book of Psalms. And what was David's attitude towards God's word? How did this impact the reformers? And what impact might it have on us today? What is the difference between devotional reading and Bible exegesis? What are some of the benefits and limitations of both approaches? Let's look at the text. Psalms 119, 103 and 104. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I again understanding, I gain, I mean, I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. And 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. And in 162, I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. Here David is expressing uh, the, 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 the benefits of reading the word of God. It says, uh, how sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey in my mouth. Uh, so David has an appreciation that the God's word is very, very important in life. Now, the difference is what, what, this, what did this impact the reformers and what impact might have us today? Now, we started last week already, that the reformers, when they found out that there is the Bible and they, they look into it and, and uh, you know, study the, the, the Bible because it was limited in distribution, it was hid, even hidden from them. And uh, so the, the question, what is the difference between devotional reading and the Bible exegesis? So this is one of the basis that uh, we need to understand that exegesis was about starting 100 years ago, it's a, it's a new process in which we look at the Bible. And devotional reading is a personal reading which uh, when you look at the text or a word in the Bible or uh, you know, a story in the Bible, it speaks to you personally. But when you do Bible exegesis, uh, you, you go back to the, to the, to the original you know, uh, context of the verse or of the story, and, and look at it from, you know, a perspective where the author was trying to, you know, to, to, to uh, write. And what does it mean? What does he mean when he wrote the text? So the difference between Bible devotional reading and the Bible exegesis is that uh, God is talking to you personally on your own devotional. But it may not be applied to other people. But when it comes to exegesis, no, there is, a, there is a, a scholar who said that when the church is divided, you have to do exegesis. That means to say that you have to really, because there is only one meaning, that means to say that exegesis 
is what God you know, says to everybody. Devotional is what God says to you personally. So uh, in, in this case, uh, we can see here that uh, uh, the, the David was very, very joyful in, in his words. So, sola scriptura, sola deo gloria. Now, the question is, uh, uh, the idea of the reformers in the 16th century literally changed the world. But they made it clear that they, there was nothing special about them. They were people transformed by God. For this reason, they declared to God alone is the, glo- the glory. And so uh, uh, here we can see the idea of how was this transformation carried out, uh, out in them. It was the reading of the word of God that performed the miracles. And uh, what did the Bible do for them and what can it do for us? It says here that it is the foundation of faith. Uh, it is not on tradition, but rather coming from the Bible. The sola scriptura, that's what it says. By believing this in his promises, we renew our faith and courage. It, it leaves, its leaves are like the fruit of the trees of life. It radiates joy, hope, and light. Meaning that there is joy even in suffering. Uh, of course, uh, you may have to distinguish between fun and joy. Fun is for the moment. You know, you are happy about it and you're enjoying it. But joy is go beyond that. It also connotes about the future. Because in suffering, there is no fun. It's no fun. But you have joy when you have the word of God. Because of the promises, it gives us direction, certainty, strength, and wisdom. And... Uh, of course, uh, it, it also gives us the... So, the scripture shines joy upon our sorrow, hope upon our discouragement, light upon our darkness. They give directions for our confusions, certainty in our perplexity, strength in our weakness, and wisdom in our ignorance. When we meditate upon the word of God and by faith trust its promises, God's life-giving power energizes our entire physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And so the grand principle maintained by the reformers, the same that had been held by the Waldenses, by the Wycliffe, by the John Haas, by Luther, and Swingley, and those who united with them was the infallible authority of the Holy Scripture as a rule of faith and practice. The Bible was their authority, and by its teaching, they tested all doctrines and all claims. Faith in God and His Word sustained these holy men, reformers, as they yielded up their lives at the stake. Be of good comfort, exclaimed the Litamer, to this fellow martyr as her flames were about to silence their voices. We shall, all, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace. In England, as I trust, shall never put out. So, through the, through the inspiring examples of the Protestant reformers, we will explore how this life-changing uh, teaching of the Scripture provides a basis for genuine purpose and true meaning in life because it, is, it gives us direction, certainty, and strength and wisdom. Understanding this eternal truth will prepare us for the final crisis in the great controversy between good and evil. We will discover a God that is big enough to get us through the challenges ahead. So that is the basis. So in this, uh, uh, it says here also that livings are being physically, mentally, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So in those dark times, the Bible saturated the lives to the point of giving their lives to remain faithful to its teachings. And today, does it also saturate your life? That is a question. So, uh, in our Monday section, uh, right here, pressing on God's word, uh, we are going to read 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. 
What does this passage tell us about Paul's confidence in the Word of God? Why were early reformers like Luther and Tyndale so anxious to translate the Bible into the common languages of their communities? Does the work we do for God matter if we never see any results? And then so uh, let's look at the text uh, that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 6. He said, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we command ourselves to everyone conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made this light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So, Apostle Paul faced an overwhelming odds in his work of spreading the gospel. He had the confidence that God's word would eventually triumph. For, he said, we can do nothing against the truth but, the truth, but for the truth. So the reformers faced similar trials. By faith, they remain faithful to God's word. An example of courage in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds is William Tyndale. The Tyndale's greatest desire was to give England an accurate, readable translation of the Bible in English. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> True to his word, <coughs> Tyndale began a translation of the scriptures into English, coming from you know uh, Greek in the New Testament. Now he started with the New Testament in Greek. He translated it to English. He was vehemently opposed in England and traveled to the continent of Europe, finding a refuge in Germany for a while. Tyndale continued his work of translation. It was a language of Israel, he said, that the Psalms were sung in the temple of Jehovah. And shall not the gospel speak of the language of England among us? Oh, the church have less light at noon day at the dawn. Christians must read the New Testament in their mother tongue. And so, driven from his home by persecution, he went to London and there for a time pursued his labors undisturbed. But again, the violence of the papist forced him to flee. But again, the violence, you know, all England seemed close against him. And he resolved to seek shelter in Germany where he began printing the English New Testament. Twice the work was stopped, but when forbidden to print in one city, he went to another city. At last, he made his way to Worms, where a few years before Luther had defended the gospel before the Diet. In that ancient city were many friends of the Reformation, and Tyndale were prosecuted his work without further and were soon finished. And another edition followed in the same year. With great earnestness and perseverance, he continued his labors, notwithstanding the English authorities had guarded their ports with the strictest vigilance. The word of God was in various ways secretly conveyed to London and then circulated throughout the country. The papists attempted to suppress the truth, but in vain. And on one occasion, a large load of Bibles was secretly shipped to England. Tendel was sending them to a friend who was a bookseller. Soon after arriving, the entire shipment of the Bible was purchased by the Bishop of Durham, 
with the purpose of destroying them. He thought that was that uh, he could greatly hinder Tyndale's work, but God was at work in mysterious ways. The bishop's money was used to purchase more paper for a better quality Bible and aided the furthering the cause of the uh, truth rather than hindering, hindering it. So when Tyndale was afterward made a prisoner, revealed the names of those, and he was forced uh, on a condition that he would reveal the names of those he had, uh, who had helped him meet the expense of printing the Bible, and he replied that the bishop of Durham had done more than any other person. For by paying a large price for the books left on hand, he had enabled him to go on and uh, in, uh, own with good carriage. It's found in Great Controversy, page 246 and 247. So the Bible available to everyone. That's what you know the reformers did uh, when they were translating the Bible into English. And so the word of God continued to spread and flourish in Acts 12, 24. So when Tyndale 8, 19, 1494 to uh, 1536 set out to correct the errors of Wycliffe's Bible translated from Latin, making a direct translation from the original language, he published the New Testament translated from Greek. And so Miles Coverdale continued and complemented Tyndale's work with the translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew originals Thus, in 1535, the first printed Bible in English was published. And the version served as the basis for the most widely used Bible translation among English speakers, the King James Version, published in 1611, the work of Tyndale, Coverdale, and the scholars who prepared the King James Version has impacted millions of people, bringing them to the knowledge of God. Would you imagine that King James Versus version was the most famous translation ever. And even now, it's still there. There are some revisions. That's why we, called, we have a new King James Version. But the original translated by Tyndale and his people were very, very important uh, in the translation of the Bible. Curiously, a man who never openly embraced the Reformation was an indispensable help in this translation, Erasmus of Rotterdam, who published a time in the New Testament in Greek, which served as the basis for all translation of the Reformers. So uh, that is uh, how, and the Bible uh, became available to everyone. While in English version of the Bible were being prepared and published, other reformers also translated the Bible into their native languages. In this way, the Bible could be read directly by the inhabitants of Europe and the newly discovered New World. Now, when I was in college, uh, I studied uh, in Montague College where it says, and around the campus, there is a, the society which is the, uh, that translates Bible into the language of the tribe. Uh, so that those tribal people, you know, in the mountains can read the Bible in their own language. And this is what the reformers did during the time. So it is important. And so Martin Luther in German, he translated 1534. Also, we have Pierre Robert Olivetan uh, in France in 1535. And then Brest Bible Polish in 1563. And then we have Casiodoro de Reina, Spanish, in 1569. And then we have Gratis Bible in Czechs in 1579. So if you notice, and then we have some more here, and Jonas Bretkunas, Lithuania, in 1579. Also, uh, Juri Dalmatin, in Slovenian, in 1584. And then Giovanni Judazi in Italian in 1607. And then we have How Ferreira de Almeida in Portuguese in 1691. Wow. And so these people, you know, really, really did English and really did something 
for the work of Christian church during the time. Now, that is our mandate. The Bible became available to everyone through translation. People now reading the Bible in their own language. And, you know, this is very, very important to begin with. Look at this one. And so, uh, on our uh, on Tuesday section, early in his university education, Martin Luther discovered a Latin copy of the Bible. Up to that point, he didn't know the Bible existed. It transformed his life almost immediately. And what do the following texts teach us about the impact of the Bible? John 14, 25 to 26, 16, 13 to 15, and 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. How do you balance the need for the Holy Spirit's illumination of the biblical text with the need to be careful in detailed study? The reformers believe in the clarity of Scripture. Do you believe that the Bible is clear? Now, let's look at the text here. John 14, 25 to 26. All this I have spoken while I was still with you. But the advocates, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See, if the, 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 the idea here is that the Holy Spirit, who inspired the author of that Bible, of that book, is the one also will allow you to understand and teach you all things and remind you of everything. And here is another text here. John 16, 12 to 15. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And that is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Wow. And then, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, the idea of enlightened by the Spirit. It is very important that our understanding without the Holy Spirit, we cannot really understand the Scriptures, the Bible. And so we need the Holy Spirit's guidance. It's just, he will guide you into the, all the truth. He will not speak on his own. So very important here, the reformers were guided by the Holy Spirit. God enlightened, it says. And so uh, the idea of this less interpreters of the Bible is that above all, you must understand that no prophecy of the scripture come about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Second Peter 120, uh, New International Version. So when Martin Luther first read the Bible in Latin, his life was transformed. And then, of course, as he flipped through its pages, he was aware that a higher power was illuminating his mind. The gospel became alive and effective. The dark traditions faded away, and the grace of Christ arose. What power illuminated his mind? The question is, the Holy Spirit, the only authorized interpreter of the Bible, was the one who revealed the truth contained in it. The same Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can understand it too. John 14, 26, 16, and 13. So, uh, from, the moment, from the moment, it was evident that there could be no harmony between the traditions taught by the official of the church and the truth contained in the Bible. The only rule of faith and conduct is contained in the Bible and is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. We call that Sula Scriptura. The Bible and the Bible alone. So, uh, the preaching of the word, quotation from the Desire of Ages here, uh, the preaching of the word will be of no avail without the continual presence and aid of the Holy Spirit. This is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. Only when the truth is accompanied 
to the heart by the Spirit? Will it quicken the conscience or transform the life? One might be able to present the letter of the Word of God. He might be familiar with all its commands and promises. But unless the Holy Spirit sets home the truth, no souls will fall on the rock and be broken. Wow. And so we are going now to deal with uh, uh, the foundation of salvation. In our Wednesday's section here, uh, <clears throat> it says that Christ alone, grace alone, uh, the very heart, the very heart of Reformation was centered in the biblical concept of righteousness by faith. I'm going to read Romans 3, 23 to 28. What do these verses state about salvation? Why do you think a book like Steps to Christ makes no mention at all of righteousness by faith? If salvation is the work of God, what role do human works play in the Christian life? How can we affirm the importance of good works in our experience, but without making them the foundation of our hope. Now, let's look at the text here. And Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, 22 to 23 to 28. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood and to be received by faith. It says, he said this, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand and punished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. If you notice this, he also took care of the past and also he did it a righteousness at the present time. Meaning to say that it's continuous at the, so that us to be just and the one who just justify those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Christ alone, grace alone. And that is the basis of the salvation in which sola gratia. It says here that sola gratia, sola faith, solus Christus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. So we are saved. The fundamental truth emerged from Ephesians 2 8. It says here, we are saved by grace alone. It says, and then the means to achieve grace is by faith alone. And then this is the gift of God, the gift of Son, Christ alone. It has nothing to do with us, it is all grace, faith, and Christ alone. So because of our sin, we are condemned to eternal death. However, God has provided a way to pay our debt and give us eternal life. Romans 3.23 And why do you need God to pay our debt? Because we cannot pay it on any way. And so when Martin Luther discovered that Christ was his only source of salvation, he began to preach the truth. Thousands who had been chained by the deceptions of the enemy were freed and transformed. Although salvation is free, it cost, its cost was infinite and sufficient for all. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And in Romans 3.32 also, so, that is really the sola gra grace alone, faith alone, and solus Christus. And that was one of the theses in, in Martin Luther's uh, 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 thesis that was uh, he nailed 
on the door of the, of, of the uh, palace there in, in Germany. And so in the introduction uh, <coughs> to this letter to the believers in Rome, Paul states that his conviction that he had been especially commissioned to bring about a new kind of obedience and it is, was so different from the kind of obedience he himself had offered before he met Jesus Christ in Damascus Road. It was to be what calls literally obedience of faith, faith alone. Here in the obedience of trusts. And low obedience is what Paul used to practice with such zeal and was not all pleased with the results that he made intolerant towards other people. Even cruel, low obedience had actually led him to violate the whole spirit of God's law, the law of love. By now urging faith obedience or trust obedience is Paul's doing away with the law? By no means, he said in Romans 3.31. Uh, on the contrary, we uphold the law. And so we put the law on its proper place. And one proper place of the law had been to serve as our attendant on the way to Christ. But the ultimate place is the one Jeremiah described. Paul agrees with uh, the, you know, agrees uh, with the prophet Jeremiah. And what the law requires may be written on the heart, the place Paul explains to the Romans where the conscience is active and people to do their thinking. Trust obedience is the kind that results from knowing God and the full meaning of the word. It comes from learning the truth about him and his use of law. It is the result of being won back to trust him as a friend, to admire him for his wise and gracious ways. This means that the spirit of truth has succeeded in writing the law on our hearts. Now we are freely do what the law requires not because we have been ordered to, but because we are convinced in our minds of what that right is right. So, we, are, we grow in grace. It says here, we grow in grace on our Thursday's lesson. Obedience, the fruit of faith. And so, in, 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 in Romans 6, 15 to 18, what does this passage teach us about salvation through Christ's righteousness alone? Let's read it. Romans 6, 15 to 18. Uh, For what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under the grace? By no means. So when Luther presented this uh, to the authorities of the church, uh, you know, the prince uh, of the country said, well, uh, if it is, we are saved by grace, then I, can, I can do anything I want. But uh, Luther reminded them of what Paul was telling them. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teachings that he was now claimed as our allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Wow. And so uh, that is uh, the uh, idea of growing grace. It says that during the Middle Ages, people thought about earning salvations and that of their ancestors through masses, bulls, lacerations, pilgrimages. Wow, that is really a terrible uh, aspect of their experience. You know, I, I have observed a lot of sufferings during the uh, uh, what's so called uh, Holy Week where people lacerate themselves and, you know, during their pilgrimage uh, in order to, you know, to, to, to appease uh, and, and as uh, the idea of uh, being saved. You know. 
uh, people are thought to earning their salvation. And yet, uh, uh, the re reformers, all of this, this tracing, it was never enough until they discovered the grace of Christ and from that moment on, on, on they felt truly free. Uh, they were enslaved because of these traditions and because of, you know, process of earning salvations. But once they learned, they discovered that the grace of Christ is enough. And from that moment, only it truly is free. And then, of course, did that freedom lead them to despise the law or to obey it? No. It says here that uh, John Wesley in 1703 to 1791, one of the founders of the Methodist movement was moved by reading Luther's introduction to Romans. His new faith led him to seek growth in grace. And that is really important in our understanding. Knowing himself, it says, knowing himself saved by grace did not lead him to despise the law, but to study it more carefully so that his life would be increasingly in harmony with the life that Christ expected of him. Wow. And so the grand principle uh, coming from the great controversy in page 249 here, the grand principles maintained by the reformers, the same that had been held by Waldenses, by Wycliffe, by John Huss, by J Luther, Swingley, and those who united with him was the infallible authority of the Holy Scripture. As a rule of faith and practice, they denied the right of popes, council, fathers, and kings to control their conscience in matters of religion. And the Bible was their authority, and by its teaching they tested all doctrines and all claims. Faith in God and His Word sustained these holy men as they yielded up their lives at stake. Be of good comfort, exclaimed Latimer, to this fellow martyr as the flames were about to silence their voices. We shall this day light such a scandal by God's grace in England as I trust shall never put out works of your Latimer's in Great Controversy, page 249. And so, here is, uh, uh, let me pause here for a moment and uh, have some discuss on this one. Many of the most historical accounts of the medieval church are extremely negative, criticizing unbiblical doctrines persecution of those who disagreed, and withholding access to the Bible for most believers. But if God is at work in every religion, where was God working in the Middle Ages? If the history of papacy is so negative, why did God let papacy win the battle to control of the church? And so what, what was God doing there? Some thousand years we call the Dark Ages. Asking on the basis of the big picture, the question of the Great Controversy, Ireland was mentioned, Czech Republic, Jerome has the wilderness, the wilderness before Luther, focuses more on the French group. Asking about the larger picture, why did God let the papacy win? If it was such a detriment to the church in many points of the church, history. And I think the answer is this. Because the church got the most important thing right. God was willing to put up with a lot of negatives, but the most important thing right, he preserves. What was the most important thing right? It was the canonization of the New Testament. There were five or six Christian groups in the early centuries it had all kinds of different canons. One of them is a small 11 books, one in the gospel and 10 uh, of the Paul's writing. That was it. And one of the monotonous groups that says anyone who has the spirit is inspired as the apostles are. We are all, the, he said, we are all Bible. So there is the two extremes. What happened in the end was that the New Testament was canonized by the church. It was broad 
it had variety of perspective, but it also was limited. So you can see, when the canon was right, a reformation was always possible. And when you, and when you get the canon right, the character of God can be clarified later on. And if the canon is off, we are all kind of lost. So the church, the early church, got the most important thing right. And if the branches of the church had won the battle, like accommodating the Constantine, it would have been very different Bible in a different church today. And most people know across different church today, most people know that the cross had been known almost throughout the world because of the Roman Catholic Church. The cross is everywhere. So God can use, you know, the negative aspects and turn it into a positive one. It doesn't matter how God chooses to do it. He works things the way he works them in the ultimate purpose. And so I hope that as we think about this negative aspects about the Catholicism, there is still a positive aspect where God was working with them. And so the opposition is a lot of whom God employs. And uh, sometimes uh, I hope that uh, that clarifies the intensity of our criticism sometimes of the church. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, uh, read the word, read the book, the Bible and the Bible only. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson, giving us an impact in learning about you through reading the Word of God. Like the reformers before, although they lost their lives, they have lives living worth living for. And may it be that it will be also our experience today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.